Welcome to the Westport Library. Today's program will begin momentarily. Supported by Verso Studios, created locally and shared with the world. My mother was a uh, substitute teacher in New Haven, and on her first day, the class was in an uproar. So she decided she'd just wait for them to quiet down. Well, 15 minutes later, they were still talking. So she stood up, and they stopped talking. <laughs> Good morning, inhabitants of Earth. And thank you for coming. Welcome to the Westport Library's 12th Forum. My name is John Brandt, and I've lived here for a coon's age. Um, today is, a, is an exciting tour of the universe, and we're here to peek behind the curtain at the extraordinary technology that has opened new astronomical vistas 
to mankind. Will these new instruments answer our questions? Maybe we'll find out today. Our tour guide to the cosmos is Dr. Martin Yellen, PhD in biomedical engineering and a lifelong ast astronomy geek. He likes astrology too, but astronomy is his choice. During his tenure at the Perkin Elmer Corporation, he worked on the Hubble Space Telescope and is intimately familiar with its successor, the newest in the astronomer's arsenal, the James Webb Space Telescope. Dr. Yellen's knowledge of the cosmos and the technology that make it real and relevant to us is unique in my circle of friends, even in the deep bench of the wise men. He is, quite frankly, the best possible person to lead us on this journey. As you'll see, his knowledge of our universe <clears throat> and beyond is only matched by his enthusiasm. Residents of Earth, please welcome Dr. Martin Yellen, our tour guide to the cosmos. Thank you, John. Uh, before I start, I want to give a couple of high fives to uh, my granddaughter uh, in London, uh, Veronica, who's 15. And today is the birthday of my daughter-in-law, Jillian. So she said, say happy birthday, Jillian. <laughs> Last but not least, I'd like to introduce my daughter and her wife, her wife, her husband, Ed. Uh, if you could just get up. Some people will recognize them from the uh, Army football games at West Point where they had the best tailgate buffet that I've ever seen, champagne included. Okay, so today, I, I assume most of you are not scientists except Michael back there, but um, I'm going to try to make it as simple as possible, but some of it you have to realize. I could just show you pretty pictures, but if you don't understand some of the science behind it, it loses its beauty. Um, so uh, I want to start with uh, this slide. For 7,000 years, people have been asking questions like this. How old is the universe, et cetera? In the last 50 years, with the Hubble, other telescopes, and now the web, we have attempted to try to answer as many of these as possible. Some of them we've answered really as fact because we were able to experimentally verify it, like Einstein's theory of relativity, and that gravity is a curvature of space. We know how big the universe is, but it's growing by leaps and bounds. It's expanding at, uh, faster than the speed of light. By the way, Einstein said that nothing could go faster than the speed of light in space, but space could go as fast as it wants, and it does, because it's not relative to anything else. Um, some of the questions here we'll never answer, like does it have an edge, and what's on the other side of the edge, because it's expanding so fast, and since the universe is only 13.8 billion years old, we can't see anything further than 13.8 billion years away. And some things are now 80 billion light years away. And it's expanding at three times the speed of light. And the further you go, the faster it goes. We didn't know this until 1998. We thought it was slowing down because you would assume after a big explosion, it would eventually, gravity would start putting a drag on it. Instead, it's speeding up. And we call it dark energy, and I'm not going to go into that in this talk. We don't know what it is. It could be another universe pulling us. It could be, we don't know. It doesn't mean we don't have ideas, but we don't know. We know that the universe is flat. We don't know if it has an edge, and we don't even know what it means to be on the other side of an edge. If space is expanding, what is it expanding into? Space? No. It gets our brains a little crazy because we live, unfortunately, in a three-dimensional world and you really got to go to about five dimensions to understand it. We know how stars are made. We know how all the elements in your body came, not from the Big Bang. Is there life on other planets? We don't know that yet, but we're getting very close. And the odds are there's probably life everywhere. 
because the same ingredients exist on every planet. A black hole's real, yes, I'll show you some pictures of them. How will the universe end? Well, if everything keeps expanding, eventually when you look up in the sky, you'll see nothing. We're talking about millions of years from now. And then eventually our Milky Way will start being pulled apart, and eventually our solar system will start pulling apart, and everything will just be dark when the, everything will burn out, and even the black holes will dissipate energy, and there'll be nothing said. But that's a long way off, uh, <laughs> even for us, um, no matter how healthy you are. And dark matter, that is very important. that We've known about it, but we, this is matter that you can't see. We don't know what it is, but yet it's five times stronger than the gravity of matter we can see. And how we found it was this wonderful, brilliant woman uh, named Rubin, her last name was Rubin, uh, who noticed that all the universes, all the galaxies, like the Milky Way, are spinning pretty fast. And when she counted the gravity of all the things she could see, it didn't make sense. It should have flown apart. It was going so fast. In other words, the centrifugal, the centripetal force would be bigger than the gravity. And she's the one that came up with that there has to be another source of, of gravity everywhere. It's called dark matter. We have no idea what it is. So that's good. It's good not to know everything. Uh, so I'm going to start by talking about the telescopes. And then I got to get into a little science, but I think you'll enjoy it. Uh, some of it you may already know. And then I'll get to some very pretty pictures. OK. So the Hubble telescope, we won the contract for that at Perkinover in 1975. And it was finished in 1985, but couldn't get launched till 1990, because in 1986, you had the Challenger explosion and all shuttle flights were stopped. So this was left in a warehouse for four years, which really got us very nervous because the slightest piece of dust on the mirrors or oil or anything could destroy the mission. Uh, because it was designed in 75 to 80, the technology was before they were computers, you know, laptops. The CCDs, the biggest CCD when we started this was 2K by 2K. That's the detector. Fortunately, in the back of this thing is where the instruments are, and they're each one that looks like a telephone box, a telephone booth, the size of a telephone booth. And five times we went up there and kept updating the instruments. The last instrument had a camera with a CCD of 20,000 by 20,000 pixels, 400 million pixels of resolution compared to 4,000 that we had, uh, four million that we had before. So it could, it's a telescope. It has a door because meteors, meteorites, and junk and dust is constantly bombarding these things. Solar panels. It was designed for 15 years. It's now on year 33. It will probably last another two years, and then it's going to run out of fuel. And the drag of the, even though it's a, it's a 300 miles, not like a million miles like the web and will crash into the Earth. However, we have, in the 33 years, we've made 15,000 discoveries that we didn't know about before this thing was launched. It's been very successful, and still is. This is the mirror. The mirror weighs 4,000 pounds. It took seven years to make. It is the smoothest mirror ever made. Somebody told me, and the mirror is 2.4 meters in diameter because it had to fit in a shuttle bay, which is three meters. Somebody told me if this mirror was the size of the United States, the biggest bump would be a quarter of an inch. So it's very smooth, unbelievably smooth. And you don't have to read all this, but it, 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 it gave us the, it, help figure out the exact age of the universe by looking at three things. And uh, it's for in the first evidence of supermassive black holes that are in the center of every galaxy, including ours. It has been very vital in hunting down thousands of planets like Earth in different stars. 
in different galaxies, and it helped to discover this thing called dark energy in 1998, which is causing the universe to just expand at a tremendous rate, and we don't know what it is. Okay. Here's the web. This is an actual mock-up, and the people that worked on it, it's an unbelievable design. Uh, it has about 20 mirrors, hexagon-shaped mirrors, coated with gold that fold up because it had to fit in a spacecraft. But the real exciting thing is th this sun shield, this thing. The temperature of the universe is about three degrees Kelvin. Oh, I have to tell you what Kelvin is. Zero degrees Kelvin is minus 273 degrees centigrade. It's the coldest temperature that could ever be achieved. At that temperature, atoms stop moving. Nothing works. There's nothing. So the universe is about three degrees warmer than that. So if this is an infrared telescope. It's looking at heat. It's looking at temperature. So any stray light or heat that gets here that's bigger than 2.7 degrees will override the signal they're trying to find. So this heat shield consists of five layers of uh, Kevlar, and each layer reduces 99% of the, of the light coming into it. It's looking down, the Earth and the Sun are down here, so it's never looking towards the Earth and the Sun. It's blocked by this, so we have five of those, and each reduces at 99%. By the time you get to the mirror, it's reduced to like 0.00001%. Fantastic. Uh, engineering design. Here you can see their mirror, which is six and a half meters against our, uh, the Hubble mirror, which was 2.4 meters. Um, and their mirror is separate little mirrors because it had to all fold up to fit within a three meter diameter spacecraft launch vehicle. It turns out that when you look at the area, it's uh, 10 times the area, it's a, the reflectivity of the gold is twice as much as the reflectivity of the aluminum, and the detectors for the wavelengths they're looking on are three times more powerful. You put it all together, this is about 100 times more powerful than this. The web can see 100 times more deeper resolution and distance than the Hubble. In fact, the universe is 13.7 years old. I'll show you this on another slide. The Hubble can look about 2 billion years before the beginning. So it could go back about 11.7 billion years. This can look 100 million miles from the beginning before even the first star was made. And I'll show you that later. So it's really fantastic. This is just a little summary. The launch web was 2021. It's designed for 10 years, but it will probably last 20 at least, uh, 12,000 pounds. The operating temperature is minus 230 degrees C. Remember, that, uh, you want to get that as cold as possible. Um, minus 270 is the absolute bottom that you could ever be. And uh, that number now working is at minus 260. So a pretty good job. And Hubble's been there 32 years, and it works at room temperature. It's a visible telescope, visible and, and ultraviolet. Webb is infrared. And the advantage of that, I have to tell you, will show up in the next slide, when I talk about the Doppler effect, which you all know with sound, but I'll repeat it. You have to know that. OK, the goals of this new telescope is to go back in time. You can't go to the beginning because for the first million or two million years, it was opaque. It was 180 billion degrees temperature of the universe. And so it was a plasma. Light could not go through it. Even heat could not go through it. It was all contained like in a, uh, a fusion cell, whatever that means. Uh, <laughs> And, 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 and it's already now beginning to see the earliest formation of stars from gas. Now, the only gas that existed, and I'll show you how it got there, is hydrogen and helium. That's all the universe made. So everything else that we're made out of, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, calcium, phosphorus, etc., did not come from the Big Bang. 
I'll save what it came from later. And the thing I'm most interested in, and this is where I'm working with the, the people down at the Greenbelt, Maryland, is extrasolar planets that have life. Not necessarily intelligent life, but I don't think we have intelligent life here. So, uh, uh, um, as you'll see, there's more planets than all the grains of sand on Earth, even including under the oceans, not just the beaches. I mean, it's just, uh, you know, it's like 70 zeros if the one. That's the number of stars we know of so far, and we can only see part of the universe, and it keeps growing. It's gigantic. It's probably infinite. Um, and now that, that's what makes it so enjoyable, because there's no politics involved. It's nature. And we don't have to know all this, but there is something wonderful about curiosity. And how did we get here? And how does it all work? And we'll never know all the answers, but considering our feeble brains and where we're located in the universe, it's amazing how much we have learned. OK. Now, why do we spend billions of dollars putting telescopes in orbit when there are some wonderful, large, bigger telescopes on Earth. In fact, there's about 30 or 40 uh, on Ma Maui at, at Mount Haleakala, which I spent three months on, in uh, Mauna Kea, Mauna uh, Loa, uh, Kitt Peak in Arizona, there's 12, uh, the Southern Observatory in Chile, there's three in Italy. You want to be on high mountains, so you have minimum light noise background and minimum atmosphere, which distorts. The trouble is there's 10,000 astronomers. And in order to get on these big 30 big telescopes, you have to reserve them 10,000 days in advance. And if it rains or it's cloudy, you go back to the back of the line. And if you're trying to get your PhD, you know, it's very, it could be very disheartening to spend 10 years learning something, and then you just have to prove it exists with a test at night on a large telescope, and you set back three years because it was cloudy that day. So that, that, that's one of the non-technical reasons. Obviously, it's much better resolution. When you look up from the Earth, you're looking through an atmosphere and different layers of temperature, so the densities are different. So it gets distorted. It doesn't matter what size the mirror is on Earth, you can't get a resolution better than a 20-inch mirror because the atmosphere just distorts it and causes the stars to twinkle and everything else. We're trying to get down to 1,000th of a, of, of a beater. Okay. But the really important stuff is that a lot of the wavelengths of interest don't come down through the atmosphere. You can only get them by going above the atmosphere. That includes X-rays, and we have X-ray telescopes. UV, the C, which is blocked by uh, ozone. You don't want UV. UVA is, uh, that comes to Earth is UVA and UVB. UVB gives you the suntan and the cancer. UVC would give you cancer immediately. It, is, it just would destroy all your chromosomes. Thank God for that's why when the ozone layer was depleting 20 years ago because of the use of Freon and hairspray and all those sprays that used to be used, the whole world, it wasn't like global warming. They knew they had to fix this fast and they banned all these chemicals. And, it, and now there's plenty of ozone in the atmosphere. And the thing, uh, of course, is looking back in time. I think I have a view graph of that. Uh, I will. I'll show you how far back you could see from the Earth, from the Hubble, and from the web. And the web is like almost to the beginning of light. Okay. Light is an electromagnetic wave. You don't have to understand what that is. It's not like sound, which is a vibration of particles. Sound can't travel in a vacuum. You know that. You put an alarm clock in a bell jar, remove the air, and you don't have any sound. Uh, light doesn't need anything. It just travels itself, and it never goes. And it's traveling always at the same speed, 
186,000 miles per second. Now, what's different for light, we see this color part. Our eyes can only see visible light. Uh, the light depends upon its frequency. So cosmic rays, which are generated by the sun, are the most dangerous light rays. Um, they're so high frequency that they would fry you. Uh, what saves us is that magnetic field, which deflects them. Mars doesn't have a magnetic field. I don't understand how people could talk about going to Mars. You'd have to live in a lead box because the cosmic rays not only stripped their atmosphere, it stripped all their water, and it would destroy all your chromosomes and genes. Uh, then comes gamma rays, which again doesn't go through the atmosphere. We have a gamma ray observatory, X-rays, which thank God doesn't go through the atmosphere. Ultraviolet is dangerous, but UVC doesn't, is blocked by the ozone, the dangerous. On the other side, so Hubble is in this visible light ultraviolet spectrum. Webb is in this uh, infrared spectrum going out to the right. And that includes things like heat. Infrared, we don't see, we feel this heat. Then, they, then as you go a little slower, you get into microwaves. All the microwave oven does is vibrate water. Of course, it'll vibrate any liquid in you too, so you don't want to be exposed to it. Same thing with radar, but then it gets to be very long, and it's radio, and that goes through us all the time, broadcast band. They're perfectly safe, and of course they come down to Earth, otherwise you wouldn't be able to hear anything. So the real dangerous stuff is fortunately kept away from us by the magnetic field, uh, ozone, and just the blockage of, of the atmosphere. The stuff we're interested in is the near ultraviolet to the far infrared, and uh, Hubble took care of the first two boxes, the black and the purple, and now Webb is looking at the others. Now, I have to talk to you about the Doppler effect so you can really appreciate this. Do you know when a car, like a police car, is coming by, as it comes near you, if it's siren is on, you hear it a high pitch, and then when it goes away, you get a low pitch. <clears throat> That's because when the car is coming towards you, think of the sound wave as a spring between the car and the ear. It's compressing the spring, higher frequency. And then when it's leaving you, it's pulling the spring, spring lower frequency. Well, light does the same thing. So when light is coming towards you, it gets higher in frequency that's towards the blue. When light is moving away from us, it goes towards the red, infrared, and eventually microwaves, radio, etc. Now, the nice thing about the web and the reason we built it is the universe is expanding. So the earliest stars that were made have expanded the most. And they've expanded so much that even if they started as a blue star, they're now invisible to visible light, but they have heat. And the web can find it. So the Doppler effect is very important. So the color of a star can tell us how fast it's moving. And Hubble telescope plotted speed versus position in the whole universe. So the color of the star tells you how fast it's moving, where it is, how far away it is, from which you can detect the brightness, from which you can figure out the mass and the size and the power. I mean, it's, it's just beautiful, just the color and all these other things fall into place. I, I find that wonderful. I know there are other things like Lady Zaza, the lady. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> I love this cartoon. I love hearing the lonesome wail of the train whistle as the magnitude of the frequency wave changes due to the Doppler effect. <laughs> yeah. Okay. This is the one I promised you. This is the how far you can see. So the bottom is, is now, the present, and to the right is the beginning, zero, somewhere. So on the ground, the best telescope could see six billion years from the beginning. So it, it can't get any closer than six billion years. It's 13.8 billion years, so 7.8 billion, uh, more than half of, uh, of, of it you can't see. Hubble got you out to about one and a half billion years. There was an upgrade where they stared for two weeks at a dark patch of sky 
and that got us out to maybe 800 million years. This never happened, the next one, and here's the web, which should get you within a couple of hundred million years of the Big Bang, which is pretty damn close, as you'll see. The next slide is the most complicated slide I have to show you, and I have to explain it, but it's worth it to me. The Big Bang. Everybody wants to know, how did it happen? What was there before? So this shows the Big Bang on the left is the beginning, when it was 10 to the 52nd degrees. That's 10 with 52 zeros after it. And by the time, it, in less than a hundredth of a second, it had cooled to 10 to the 13th degrees. It was so hot in the beginning that nothing could survive. It was just all energy. But there's a very peculiar thing that happens at that temperature, which we've been able to prove at the Large Hadron Collider. When gravity is exposed to very high temperatures, over 9 billion degrees, and 10,000 atmospheres, you know, the 14.7 pounds per square inch times 10,000, it reverses. Instead of attracting, it repels. And so what happened, when that happened, you had this tremendous inflation, they call it, where it went from the size of a hundredth of a virus to the size of the Earth in 10 to the minus 23rd seconds. That's point zero 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 one second, 23 zeros. Unbelievable. And then it stopped going that fast, and we thought it'd just keep coasting and eventually slow down. As it expanded, it cooled. And this comes the hard part now, and little particles started to appear. Before we get to them, we'll talk about before the Big Bang, what was there. According to Einstein, who was a pretty smart guy, who's not in the audience, okay. Uh, <laughs> he, uh, he said, space and time began at the Big Bang. If you look at these equations, you put T equal minus, a minus sign on time, it's zero. He said, there was no space here, there was no time, so how could you go back? He said, it's like walking to the South Pole, and, tell, and you're right at the South Pole and you want to keep walking south. You can't. Every direction you walk would be north if you're at the bottom or at the top down. So <laughs> he, a lot of, that's probably true what he said, but a lot of scientists don't like that answer. It's like a, you know, you want to know more. So a lot of theories are being tested now at the Large Hadron Collider. One is that this was the beginning of the, the, of, of the universe was the collapse of a previous universe, which had collapsed the whole universe and caused this hot central mass, tiny, tiny, almost like smaller than a virus, and then it expanded. It's hard to prove. People are working on it, and there'll be some Nobel Prizes when someone figures out. But even, even if Einstein's right, and space and time did not exist before this point, what was there? You can't say nothing, because as I'm about to show you, nothing is nothing. There's no such thing as nothing. Prop. I have to show you this. This is a jar with a vacuum on it. The weight of it now is exactly the weight you'd calculate for an empty jar. You know, you measure the volume by putting it in water and seeing how much water it displaces, and, and, and you weigh it to six decimal places. So there's nothing in here. It's empty space. But if Einstein was in the audience, he says, you didn't take out everything. I say, what do you mean? He said, you didn't take out the space. You have to take out the space. Space is alive, and, 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 and it's not empty. Now, our brains can't comprehend this. But we tested this, I didn't, I mean, the Large Hadron Collider, they took a vacuum and they bombarded it with very high energy and out came all these little particles out of the space that didn't exist. All they bombarded with it was with light, high energy light. And these particles created particles and antiparticles and they canceled out and everything went back to zero. So nothing. But every once in a while, for every billion times this happened, there was one extra matter particle that didn't have an antiparticle to cancel it out. 
And that is the beginning of us. <laughs> that, those little particles, which are called quarks, if anybody ever read Finnegan's Wake by James Joyce, that's the book where the last page continues on the first page. Well, there's a scene in there in a, in a pub where somebody says, three quarks for must the mark. And Murray, Bell, Murray Gelman, who discovered the quark, read that book and he gave it the name quarks. Now, quarks are so small that they're smaller than a proton or a neutron. We all know what atoms are, protons, neutrons, and electrons orbiting it. But the protons and the neutrons we've discovered eight years ago contain quarks. If you illuminate it with uh, x-rays, if there was nothing in it, it would just go right through. But they saw things bouncing back, and the shape was like a little triangle. That's a quark. There's six kind of quarks, up quark, down quark, strange quark, charm quark, bottom quark, top quark. I mean, it, we can't comprehend this. But the Large Hadron Collider makes these every day. So now as it cooled, the quarks caused they started to get together. You need three quarks to make a proton. It was so much energy in the beginning, they couldn't get together. As it cooled, they started to make protons. Those are those little red faces there. And neutrons, which is also three quarks, but different quarks. And eventually, it cooled and cooled. And eventually, you had the beginning of an atom, but the electrons still didn't they were still wildly bouncing all around because it was so hot, there was so much energy. But finally, at, at 380,000 years, 320,000 years, atoms formed. And that's what you can see. That's when light came through. This was all a plasma, this. Everything from the beginning to 320,000 years is where you see the beginning of atoms. And. Uh, it's like the third thing from the end. And then those atoms had mass, and they had gravity. And they started to attract each other, and they formed. And I'll show you how they made, they became stars and galaxies and planets and life. And I'll go through that. So this is pretty complicated. And uh, nobody understands what I just said. Even the people that discovered it. It's. Uh, but it's there, it's nature. We just don't understand it yet. Maybe 100 years from now, they'll look back at us like we look back at the medieval times and when they thought the sun went around the earth. Uh, and they'll think how naive we were, just as we think how naive they were. Actually, if we would have not had the Crusades, we'd be 200 years ahead of us now. Because the Arabs were the best astronomers. And that's why every, a lot of stars have Arab names. They also gave us algebra. They also gave us algorithms, but they didn't give us alcohol. <laughs> okay. So the universe is expanding, John Fox. And if this balloon, every dot there is a Milky Way, a galaxy. So what's expanding is not the galaxies, not the stars, it's the space. So everything sees everything else moving away from them. No matter where you are, everything is moving away from you because it's the space that's expanding. So space expands. And gravity you know, is a curvature of space. So in order for something to expand and move and curve, it has to have energy. And e equal mc squared, energy equal mass times the speed of light squared, that means it has to have mass, empty space. That's the mass, the quarks which theoretically disappear after they're made, but once in a while, for a reason we don't know, one out of a billion survives and keeps going like that and forms the whole universe. Again, this could all be wrong, but it's the current thinking. It doesn't matter if it's wrong. It, it, it leads us to where we have to put our brains. And there's no politics involved, so it's the best part. Okay, light, light is amazing. It goes 380,000 miles a second, or six trillion miles a year. The nearest star to us is four light years away. And it has planets, 
So that means it's 24 trillion miles away. Now, the fastest spacecraft we ever made, I think it was the Japanese, is 100,000 miles an hour. If you were going to use that to get to that star, it would only take you 600 million years. <laughs> so alien, why would an alien, I, I mean, I don't care how smart they are and what they've done, they come here, they rape a farmer's wife, and they leave. <laughs> I mean, it just doesn't make any sense, you know. <laughs> the, the, co the cost would be tremendous. And I don't care how fast they go, even if they figured out a way to beat light speed, which we don't know how that could be, uh, it would take thousands of years. So forget about aliens. And why would they want to come here? <laughs> okay, so because of the speed of light being finite, it takes time for us to see something. So we all know that the Earth to the sun, the sun is 93 million miles away. It takes seven or eight minutes for the light to get to us. If the sun disappeared right now, we wouldn't know for eight minutes. But then we wouldn't be here after eight minutes. Uh, here's the nearest star. i got to put this on. 4.3 light years. So that means that a telescope was really a time machine, and I love this. If you look at a planet 100 billion light years away, you're seeing that light that left 100 billion years ago, not how it is now, because it took 100 billion years for that light to get to us, because it can't go faster than the speed of light. So think of it this way. If you were an alien on another planet, maybe 150 light years from Earth, and you were listening to Earth to see if there's life here, you hear nothing, because radio was invented in 1920, okay? So if they were 102 years away from us, they'd start hearing radio programs, and it would take 100 years for them to get to it. So our love Lucy should be coming up soon <laughs> on the nearest star, 2055. Um, Okay, I know you want to see pretty pictures. Okay, this is old. This says there are so many stars, more than a grain of sand of all the beaches. Well, now they discovered there's not 100 billion galaxies, there's three trillion galaxies that we now have discovered. So now it's not every star on the beach, not every grain of sand on the beach. It's all the grains of sand under the ocean, too. There's more stars. And almost every star has planets. So the idea of just us, there's a little probability, but it's very hard to find these. It's so big and far away. This is a beautiful, this is a black. Uh, on the Hubble, they decided to look at this, a part of the sky about the size of a dime, which was absolutely black. There was nothing there. And our job was to design a pointing system so it wouldn't move for 10 days, in which they absolutely still, you know, you have solar winds and you have some gravity and you have meteorites. And, and after 10 days, this is what they saw at this little spot. Every one of those is not a star. They're a galaxy like the Milky Way. And everywhere we looked, we saw this. Everywhere. The whole universe is uniform with these galaxies. And these are visible galaxies now. Webb has also made this picture. I don't know if I have it. No, I don't. Um, uh, okay. But uh, you see more with the web because you can see the stars that are so old that they're red and infrared and almost microwave wavelengths. Again, you understand the Doppler shift. Very important to know. Uh, that's why Webb exists, because of the Doppler shift. next. Okay. This is a picture, a uh, recent picture from the web of, of a, it's called a pinwheel galaxy. And it's slowly attracting these other small galaxies. You can see it's beginning to uh, tear them. Eventually it will collide. Just like we're going to collide with Sagittarius, which is our closest galaxy. We're moving to each other. And uh, it may not be so bad when we collide because there's so much space between the stars that would we might just be able to accommodate it, but you don't know. But that's billions of years old, too. This picture came to me from Webb two days ago, and I love it 
person said, what the hell is this? It looks like you're looking at the rings of a tree, you know. And what it is, they figured it out, I don't know how they figured it out so fast, that there's another star that periodically visits this star, they kiss, and then it goes away. But when it cuts close, it takes some of that star because of gravity and moves it out a little. And it comes back every million years and does the same thing. So there's 17 here now. So from here to here is 17 million years. And each time this star is getting smaller and smaller, and eventually there'll be nothing left to take. So it's just a fantastic picture. It's in the infrared. They convert it to visible light so you could see it. All the pictures from web, from web are invisible to us, eyes, our eyes. So they all have to be artificially colored. Um, I put this here because I can't talk about it, but all these stars I just showed you, all these planets, all these galaxies, that only represents, we've discovered, only 4.6% of the universe. There's a thing called dark matter. I mentioned it before. It, you can't see it. We don't know what it is, but it has gravity, tremendous gravity. And without dark matter, all the galaxies would fly apart because they're moving at over 160,000 miles an hour, and they would just, the centrifugal force would just, so the gravity holds them in more. And that's estimated to be five times as much gravity as everything you can see. And then this dark energy, this thing that's pulling us away, everything away, that's the equivalent energy based upon how fast it's moving and how, how much energy it's providing. I mean, so most of the universe is dark energy. We did not know this existed until 1996, 1998, and the two guys won the Nobel Prize. We thought the Earth was slowing down, the atmosphere was slowing down. It's speeding up. Something out there is attracting us, big time, big time. And eventually, all, this, all the other stars will disappear. Here's a photo of a black hole. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a real photo. This is Sagittarius. I can't take a picture of the Milky Way because we're in it. But Sagittarius is very similar to us. And the black hole is in the center, and it's chomping away chomping away, eating stars, gas, whatever. But it takes, we're, we're out in one of these arms in, on, in the Milky Way. It would take about 40 million years to get to us, and we'd be gone long before that. In fact, I don't think it was four years. This is a picture by, uh, just came from Webb. It's looking down on a black hole, and it looks like the Michelin Man. It seems to have these bands, narrow and wide, narrow and wide, like a corrugated thing. We never saw that before. We don't understand it, and we're working on it. This is a picture from Hubble of a black hole destroying a galaxy like the Milky Way. It's eating it. The, the black hole is somewhere over here, and it's just pulling and pulling by gravity all the material, all the hundreds of millions of stars etc. So this is a picture of Sagittarius, and we're on that last tail on the lower left-hand corner. We're about 40 million light years from the center. The whole diameter of the Milky Way is about 80 billion light years, 40 billion from the center, 80 billion light years across. One of trillions. And that leads to our little Milky Way, uh, in the Milky Way, our, our solar system. I'm not going to talk about the planets, although we now think that we could find life of some kind on Io and Europa, which are two moons of Jupiter covered with ice. But now we see sprouts of seawater coming through the ice because the gravity is so strong on Jupiter that as this moon goes around, it squeezes the ice and it becomes liquid. And by looking at the color of the plume, you could tell what material, what minerals, what elements are in there. And it looks like there's an ocean under 100 feet of ice containing all the same ingredients that our ocean contains. Could be plants and mice, so uh, plants and mice. Plants and humans uh, could be nothing. We're sending a probe there in three years, which will dig down and look around. 
see if we can see any Martian gefilte fish. <laughs> Jupiter. <laughs> Got to have a sense of humor to understand this stuff. All right, our star is like an average star. Uh, some are one-tenth as much, some are a hundred times bigger. Uh, the size, uh, some are as small as the Earth and some are as big as our solar system. And the power is unbelievable, from one ten thousandth to a hundred thousand, a factor of a billion. So our star is not big enough or strong enough to create a supernova. We didn't, you know how a star works, I'm going to show you, but basically it's gravity. The star has a lot of gravity. It's trying to crush in. And when it crushes in, it could cause atoms to fuse and create a hydrogen bomb equivalent fusion, which causes an explosion out. And what you do is you get a balance between the gravity trying to pull it in and the explosion trying to make it come out. So when it runs out of fuel, it collapses completely. And if it's very big, it explodes in what's called a supernova. And I'm going to give you a head start on this. The hydrogen turns to helium. Two hydrogens make a helium. Then the heliums are squeezed together, and they make uh, three of them together, and they make carbon all the way up the 92 elements is all in the explosion of supernovas that's going on all the time, and it's everywhere in the universe. So we are made of stardust. We really are. Hoagie Carmichael was right, if you remember. Our son is four and a half billion years old, probably live another four or five. Pretty big. You could put a thousand Earths in it. I don't know how they weighed it, but it's very easy to weigh it. 44 with 30 zeros after it, pounds. You know how you weigh the sun? You just see how fast it takes to go around one year, and the distance, 93 million miles, you put it in an equation that was developed in the 1500s by a guy named Kepler, and out comes the mass. Physics. The interesting thing about the sun, it, in the center, it's 10 million degrees. That's where the nuclear fusion is going on, the furnace. And the surface temperature is about 6,000. Interesting on the sun, if you go away from the surface, it goes up to 10 million degrees. And first, we couldn't figure out what that was. It turns out there were magnetic rays coming out of the sun that heat the atmosphere to millions and millions of degrees. So it's very complicated. But here's what I like. Every second, the sun produces the energy, every second, of a trillion megaton bombs. In one second, it produces enough energy to supply the Earth for 500,000 years. And when the sun finally collapses, it won't explode. It'll just let go of its outer layers, and it'll, the sun will become the diameter of Mars. So we will be burnt, destroyed. What's really interesting here is that for 100 years ago, instead of discovering oil, somebody melted some sand, which is everywhere, and that's silicon. And we could have made solar cells easily. I mean, with a little thinking. It, it, it's not that hard. And it could, could, could have been that we would go to a solar-controlled power system and forget about global warming and all these other problems. But we didn't. So this is, again, how it works. You have hydrogen, and they have one hydrogen has one neutron, one proton. It's called deuterium. It's used in hydrogen bombs. Tritium has two. Uh, ne neutrons. The squeezing of the gravity causes them to fuse into helium. And the energy that comes out, remember E equal mc squared? Well, the mass of the helium is a little less than the mass of these two, because there's some other things that come out. And if, if you look at this equation, a couple of ounce difference in mass times the speed of light squared can produce 100,000 to a million tons of TNT. The hydrogen bomb, the Russia built the biggest one, was 100 megatons, and that, that used up three ounces of fuel. And it made 100 million tons, which would destroy the whole country, the world. So this is Einstein's most famous equation. And it really tells you that mass is stored energy. Energy, wherever you have energy, you have to have mass, so that invisible, Space I told about, that if you, that under the right conditions, little particles start coming out, that's the mass. So it all fits together. 
And this was all discovered in the 1940s, 30s, and led to the making of the atomic bomb, and then eventually the hydrogen bomb. Too bad. <laughs> I, <did. laughs> I know, it's complicated. It's complicated. All right, now pictures. Uh, this is uh, a lot of people's favorite picture. It's called the Pillars of Creation. The distance from the top cloud, it's a cloud of gas, okay, just gas and dust. And the gravity is so, the, the size from the top to the bottom is 600 trillion miles. So what's happening in that cloud is the dust and the gas are being squeezed by gravity and gravity until nuclear fusion starts and a star is born. And these little baby stars all over here, and there's a picture from the uh, web which shows thousands more because it could see through the cloud because it's infrared. And, uh, and stars are born. Every minute there's a star being born. It's all due to gas and hydrogen. So the, when the star is born, it's only made out of hydrogen and maybe some helium. But when a big star explodes, it makes every other chemical in the explosion on the, on the, on the periodic table. So it's, it's just, it leads to the question, is the universe the way it is for us? Or is it just random that we would not exist if the universe was different? If some of the numbers, like if E equals 0.9 mc squared rather than mc squared, you wouldn't get the energy. You wouldn't get the amount of energy you need to make these fusions happen. So, I mean, it's, everything is like to six places. So, are these laws or is this just one of thousands of universes? We don't know. Now that we have, we've discovered this dark energy, we're beginning to think there's another universe out there very close to us in a different dimension which we can't conceive of uh, that's pulling on us faster and faster and faster. Fascinating. Oh, yeah. Uh, i see if I could blow this up. Uh, probably can't. But uh, the one on the right is the same picture taken by Webb. And if you, if you I'm, I'm sorry, I apologize at the signs, but um, it, it's... Um, it sees like 10 times as many stars. And this is going on all over the clouds. All the, uh, this is one you're all familiar with. This was the first picture sent by Webb. It looks like a mountaintop that you could hike under the stars. This is all dust, this brown stuff. First of all, it's not brown, this is colored. And the dust is making stars, and when the stars are made, they put out UV light. So this is all was deep UV, you couldn't see it. So they made it blue, but it's such a beautiful picture, you know. I mean, it could be anything. It could be a mountain range in Utah, but it's just a cloud of dust doing its thing. Beautiful. I wish I understood it more. I really do. Now, when a big, this is another galaxy. It's called the Sombrero Galaxy for obvious reasons. This bright spot in the upper left is a star supernova. A supernova is when a big star explodes, it implodes, and squeezes so high that it makes everything else when it explodes. It is brighter than the 100 million stars in the galaxy. That's how bright it is, okay? And uh, I had that same picture with Webb of that same thing. Those lines you see are not anything to do with the picture. It has to do with the fact that the hexagon-shaped mirrors have edges, and so you get the fraction around the uh, image. But that is bright. I mean, uh, these are galaxies, not stars. You know, these are like 100 trillion stars in each one of these dots. Now, here's the key picture. Uh, yeah, you got to follow this. So originally, it's just hydrogen. And as the gravity gets stronger, it squeezes the helium. So there's less energy, so it collapses even more. So now it's stronger, so it squeezes the helium into nitrogen and then into carbon, and it keeps, it keeps getting smaller and smaller and harder and harder. 
until it explodes. And all those chemicals go all over the universe, everywhere. And we could tell what everything is made of. I'll show you how. It's very simple. It turns out every color has a fingerprint or a barcode. And if you just look with a spectrometer, you could see exactly what things are made of. In fact, that's being used by Webb to see if there's life on other planets by looking at the atmosphere. And if they see oxygen and methane, that's a good clue there's at least plant life. Fascinating. I mean, they, this is part of a 26-hour lecture that I attended twice <laughs> and try to get it down to 50 minutes. I got five minutes. So this is what it looks like when it explodes. And, and, and before, before it exploded, all you had was hydrogen and helium, one and two. We're made out of everything over here, you know, uh, silicon, phosphorus, sulfur, oxygen, nitrogen, you name it, you know what, calcium, iron, all that. If the star didn't explode, a big star didn't explode, none of these elements would exist, and we'd just be hydrogen balloons, you know, or helium balloons. It's, it's just remarkable to me. Yeah, I wanted to show you this because this is sodium, nitrogen, hydrogen, and, and oxygen. When you look with a spectrometer, which is like a prism, which breaks up the light, every element has its own signature. So you could tell what the sun is made of, you could tell what anything is made of by looking at the atmosphere. The other nice thing is, is when they're moving away, you get the Doppler shift, Doppler, and all these things move to the right if it's moving away, but they, their separation stays the same, so you know it's still sodium, but it's moving away from you. And by the distance it moves away from you, you can tell how fast it's going and where it is. It's just beautiful. So, so that's how, you, how we do it. I mean, the spectrometer is really key. And the Hubble had one, but only visible. But now that the, I'm really sure that within a year or less, they'll be discovering life on exoplanets. I didn't say intelligent life, but they'll be able to see enough gas to, to figure out that the only way those gases could have been there if something is rotting, okay? And hydrogen doesn't rot. People rot. <laughs> yeah, this, this is what I just said. The, the nitrogen makes our DNA, the calcium makes our bones and teeth, the iron makes our blood, the carbon makes everything else. We are made of star stuff. And a different star probably made the atoms in your right arm than your left arm. It's just amazing. It's all over the place. And when we look at every single star, we see the same things. And every single planet soon will see the same things, and then we'll know where there's life. You know this guy, Dyson, Friedman? Life doesn't exist anywhere but Earth. That's like filling a cup with ocean water and saying there aren't any whales. <laughs> I like that. So far, we have found 6,000 planets like Earth. This is just showing. It just keeps growing every day. And, uh, and the one that's most interested in where uh, Webb is focusing now is it's called the Trapper System. It's six, seven planets all with water on them. This is a much dimmer star than the sun, so the first planet is pretty close, but it's not that hot. In other words, liquid water exists. This planet here is just like Earth in terms of temperature, water, Atmosphere, oxygen, carbon dioxide, methane, you know, trouble is it's 800 light years away, 800 light years away. So if we wanted to say hello, <laughs> the only thing that travels at the speed of light is be like laser beams or radio. So you say hello, 800 years later they hear it, and then what if the line is busy? You gotta do it again. <laughs> and so it's just so big, so fucking big, pardon me. This is the goal of, of the James Webb Telescope. They think that with the present system under the right conditions where they can block out all the background light, they can image a large planet. This is not, a, or this is not the Earth. This is an artist's rendition of what they think they could see where the white stuff is water and the other stuff is mountains and land. And if you see lights, oh, that would be exciting, wouldn't it? Maybe in our grandchildren's time.
but th that's the goal I'm in my end. Oh, I said this before, the best proof that there's intelligent life is that one hasn't come here. <laughs> Arthur Clarke said that. The guy who did 2001, A Space Odyssey. And again, uh, this is the only way you could communicate. That's why we have, in New Mexico, 600 dishes. Every time we find a star that has the right seam to atmosphere, we start aiming at that star to listen. And imagine, even if it's a thousand light years away, Imagine if they had their equivalent of Google, and we're listening in on those signals, and they're a thousand years ahead of us in knowledge, or a million years, or a billion years. Uh, it would be amazing what we'd learn. If we're the only one, then, God, we sure didn't take good care of this place. That's the end of my talk. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Earthlings, we, um, we've been um, privy to a truly great teacher. Um, I don't know about you, but when I was signing up for science courses, I'd break out in a cold sweat. <laughs> Raise your hand if you'd choose this man to be your professor. Oh, yeah. Thank you. We're going to take your questions over here, but you're going to have to toddle over to use this microphone. Who's boom, first? Boom, boom. Uh, a comment and a question. First of all, in the last, you know, NASA has this great history of having their missions, science missions, last a lot longer than planned. And even in the past month, they've commissioned a study to have Crew Dragon push the uh, Hubble from its present 535 kilometers up to 600 kilometers where it started off. That doesn't seem as possible with the web, which is a million miles away. How long would the web stay in orbit around the Lagrange point? Around the million-mile mark? I think well, it's a million Earth, miles away. The Earth is going 67,000 miles an hour around the sun. That's one year. So it's, you know, we know the distance, 93 million miles. So a million miles is practically 1% of the Earth's distance to the sun, 93 million miles versus one mile. So it would take a year. To go around. Marty, would you move to your left a little and make the microphone your friend? I can't hear you. Oh, that's good. Now we can hear you. Yes. <laughs> Who's I'm next? Uh, did you get my answer? Uh, yes. Okay. We can hear you better if you're talking into the microphone. I know, but I can't hear better. <laughs> and I got it has to do with sound earphones. waves, you know. <laughs> <laughs> a question is on its way. I only answer easy questions. This is, this is an easy one. Um, uh, I, first of all, thank you for speaking to us, and I appreciate your sense of humor. You ply us with very interesting data, then you peek around the corner of your speech and hit us with a zinger. It's very good. But I want to know how, uh, I have a completely different question for you. How did you sleep well? in August 1990, when the null reflective corrector was not detecting oh. the error. You mean the Hubble telescope error? Yeah. yeah. Good. Thank you. That was due to an error in the measuring equipment that measured the mirror. And, and in order to build it, you had to have the spacing between two mirrors in the test equipment exact. And it was a metering rod, a metering rod, yeah. and a speck of paint came off that metering rod, so when the laser aligned them, they were off by one millionth the thickness of a hair. Yeah. We wanted to retest it for four years. It sat in a warehouse, but NASA didn't want to do it. And when we got up there, we found the problem. The problem is fixed very easily. Contact lenses, so every instrument had contact lenses put in it in front, and it, it was beautiful. But it was very embarrassing. Uh, not I, but some of my co-workers had to testify in Congress, and they were insulted and told they should go to jail. Mm. You know, we wanted to retest it when it was all put together. We had only tested it separately, mirror, you know, yeah. solar panels, this, that. Was it tested in Danbury? We tested it first in Danbury, and then we went to Lockheed yeah. in California, where they integrated it into the spacecraft. 
but they didn't do any optical testing. Good. Thank you. That was a bad time in my life. <laughs> Marty, the, um, what you say about the distances and, and all the rest of it means, in terms of finding things, it could be kind of boring for us for a while. Now, science fiction writers get around this by talking about things like wormholes and that kind of thing. Do, do you and the other serious scientists think about uh, that as well, or do you just dismiss that? Well, there is some scientist, uh, uh, I forget his name, he's at Caltech, who thinks that uh, two black holes could connect through what's called an Einstein-Rosen bridge, which is a wormhole and that you could enter it at one end and come out on the other end at a different place and time. So if you imagine space as a flat sheet and you had to go from here to here, if you folded the sheet like this and you just had to go from here to here through the space, that's what a wormhole is. But there's no evidence yet without gravity in a, in a, in a black hole uh, that you could survive that, such a thing. But people are still working on it. They're probably all wormholes all over the place. Um, but it, that, that's the concept. It would be wonderful, because then you could go faster than the speed of light. Well, not that you go fast, it's just that the distance would be very small. Yeah. Another question? What's for lunch? <laughs> <laughs> Look out for this guy. He's had combat experience. I know. I know him. He's a helicopter pilot in Vietnam. Marty, and is there a center uh, where this Big Bang took place? No. Or could you, you can't find it? No, there is no center. The Earth, the, the whole space expanded. There is no center. It isn't like one place that went like that. It's hard to us to visualize, yeah. but everything was, everything was created at the Big Bang. There was no center. That's clear. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> we used to think we were the center, and then the Crusades really screwed us up for about 400 years. <laughs> Marty, in the last couple of minutes that we have before we release you to um, perpetrate fraud on the public, tell us a little bit about how you got here through your interest in so many different areas of science. Well, it's just, uh, it's not really so many different areas, it's physics. And I have a doctorate in biomedical engineering, which was half physics um, and half medicine and biology. Because in those days, we were developing synthetic organs, artificial arms. You know, it was after the Vietnam War, and we, prosthetic devices was big. And that, but eventually, we got out of that because too many lawyers got involved, because you can, you always make mistakes. Um, but it's just, uh, I'm very curious. You know, I'd rather, I think I have a statement here. This was by uh, a guy named Ferris, who wrote the, uh, the something at the end of the universe. He says, I'll take the awe at understanding over the awe of ignorance any day. That's how I feel. It doesn't, it, it doesn't help my problems on Earth with politicians and money and, and global warming and disease and hatred and racism and all that, but, but that's part of the nice thing about it. It, it. It's really beautiful. I mean, it's hard, but it's beautiful. And what's even more beautiful is that we don't know a lot of it. So there's... There's so much to find out. Yeah. Today's lecture is a template on what this library is all about. Okay. Knowledge. Thank you.